Hello, friends, and welcome to Looking Up. This is a podcast for Christian women. My name is Carla Moore, and I am in Dripping Springs, Texas. And with me is my dear friend, Kathy Pollard, and she is about to blow away in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Apparently, there is a series of storms going through, and we were maybe laughing just a little bit about if, if you know, we might have some good ratings if a tornado hits right in the middle of recording. And she's going to, what are you going to do when, when you go swirling into the sky? gonna say keep looking up <laughs> with a smile on your face <laughs> that's right no for real what's going on there with the weather it, you know we get a lot of this here which I didn't know ahead of time but um it's been rainy and stormy all week long and then today we're under tornado watch and um so at the time of this recording it's actually Wednesday and about the time we get ready to go into Bible class tonight it's supposed to be high winds and hail two inch hail and all kinds of stuff coming so <laughs> we have yeah. businesses closing down early today wow and all kinds of stuff so we will see how this yeah. recording goes i like a good storm until the storm hits and then i'm thinking what was i thinking this is scary yeah i used to like a good storm and now they're too many too often accompanied by some so- sort of tornado yeah. threat and I, and y'all have I, actually had I, yes, some pretty dicey seen, weather. We've the last seen couple the years. destruction from that and I don't mm-hmm. like it. So yeah. now it makes me a little bit anxious. <laughs> yeah. Thunderstorm. I mean, just not, not the high winds, the hail, the tornado, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Speaking of tornadoes, have you seen the, um, you know, the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning and they have like a little GIF that shows how do you, what do you, how do you know the difference? And they use tacos. Have you seen that? No. So a taco watch would be like, here's the taco shell and here's the taco meat and here's the lettuce and the tomatoes and the cheese. And it's all, you know, kind of laid up like that. That's a taco watch. And then the taco warning is when it's all put together and it's ready to eat. So it's like a tornado warning is when it's literally there's been one spotted and a watch just means that conditions are right. You know that, but mm-hmm. anyway, yeah, well, I hope that it goes well. I think you said that Ollie was a little bit anxious too. So <sighs> Ollie is driving me crazy. He's shivering and whimpering and panting and, and that's is he right on, next to you right now. That's on the thunder wonder dog shoe. So <laughs> he was, he just hopped down and now he's laying on the floor right next to me. Well, he might be like your little weather dog and you'll know that if there's something really bad coming, you'll, you'll feel him right there next to you. Oh, he's me. A little Poor, weather guy. Dog. Poor guy. Well, I hope that nothing happens. That's we've had quite a bit of weird weather, but not anything like that. And this is just the month for that. And mm-hmm. April and May, usually we get exciting stuff. Well, so I guess that's kind of keeping you from gardening and getting things going outside. Yeah, the the bright side of all of that is it has been raining every day. So I haven't actually had to go out there and water since last mm-hmm. weekend. So that's fantastic. And my garden is just exploding. I mean, yes. I can see everything. You need to put some pictures up. in the group. Yeah, you're right. I should do that. So you have flowers or vegetables I or both? Have both flowers, herbs, and vegetables. Nice. Mm-hmm. Well, John laid up half a pallet of grass. A couple of days ago, um, we have a right next to our driveway. It's a sloping area that just always washes away, wash, keeps washing away from the driveway. So um, it's like an instant half yard there. It's really nice. I don't like buying grass, though. It's kind of like buying dirt. Yeah. Although I like buying grass better than buying dirt. Yeah. No (laughs) stickers. It's very nice. But we just had a uh, Turner for four days and literally, literally just got back from dropping her off with uh, Jacob and Alyssa. And they had gone to a work thing down in Florida. I teased them because they were landing in Orlando and I said, you're really going to Disney World, aren't you? You're just saying you're work. going to work. Yeah, That's what they're calling it. <laughs> uh, how was your work meeting? Uh-huh. That's right. But they did go to Disney Springs one day, which is just a little town. I don't I don't know much about it, but apparently it's a little town outside of Disney World. You don't have to pay to get in. It's like a little resort town because Jake loves some kind of ice cream that's there. And anyway, we had fun with Turner and she she slept pretty good and and we just gave her whatever she wanted, basically. And that was fine. I mean, she had ice cream this morning at 930. That's not a big deal, is it? Oh, it's she told me she wanted chocolate with sticks. She kept pointing her fingers down. I need chocolate with sticks. And sticks? I was trying to interpret what is chocolate with sticks, like a s'more or something, or, or, you know, I couldn't figure out until I realized that she had had a chocolate ice cream bar 
like a little oh, magnum bar and it had a stick in it. So <laughs> she was excited about chocolate with sticks. So oh, anyway, it's fun. I don't know, like one little three-year-old girl. I don't understand why that wears me out as much because I used to have three little boys all the time. Mm-hmm. I guess just because I'm out of practice. That, that's one reason. <laughs> that's one reason. It's not because I'm older. It's oh, nothing okay. to do with that. It's absolutely <laughs> zero, no, nothing to do with that. But I think more than anything, it's just that I don't want her to get hurt when, you know, I'm just so much more nervous than I used yeah. to be with my own kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Well, that sounds fun. Did you thrift anything exciting? You, you didn't know, have a chance to because. No, she mm-hmm. didn't bring any tennis shoes. She loves to wear dresses and that's oh. just her thing. She has like little princess pajamas that she wears for dresses and that's what she wears at home all the time. But when we were out that day doing yard work, she didn't have any tennis shoes. So I did to go run and see if I could find some tennis shoes for her at Goodwill. And I found some that were a little bit too big, but she did not want anything to do with them. She's very polite about it. She says, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you is what it comes out sounding like. No, thank you. But no, that's the only, I didn't, there was no thrifting going on this week. So, but I did watch this video yesterday that I was going to tell you about. I just came across when I was looking at something on YouTube, it popped up. And what's the deal with those nowadays too, that your newsfeed, mine is all about yoga for seniors and things like that. <laughs> Don't you just want to say mind your own business? Yeah. Stop <laughs> listening to me. Cause I know I've said, I'm going to start doing yoga. Well, how do they know I'm a senior anyway? <laughs> So this popped up. It was how not to be frumpy. Oh, so I thought. Send me that. I'm kind of curious. What are they? I want to know how frumpy I am. Do tell. Yeah. So the there was five different points that she had. Apparently, she's this big deal. It was dressed for my day with Kay Harms. Oh, I know her. Not personally. You, know, you don't know, know, her, know her. Right. I've never I heard of her before. I know who you're talking about. Well, what have you seen her do? She does a lot of like wardrobe basics and capsule wardrobes and how to find your style and how to mm-hmm. not look frumpy. <laughs> yeah, well, it was eye opening. It was funny too, because this was something I watched yesterday. And then today in the group, Charlotte Oren posted, I don't know if you've seen this yet, I but she saw said that. we should that do like hilarious. a fashion show. And I thought, <laughs> me, us. Okay. She's not as confused as them other YouTube people. Yes, so yeah, because um, <laughs> I'm the one watching the how not to be frumpy videos. <laughs> Excuse me, but the, she gave five different points. So I just jotted them down when she was explaining to me how not to be frumpy. And the first one is about your hair. And you've got this one. You're You're good on this one. She said it's not about the gray because she said there's lots of wonderfully non-frumpy women who have gray hair, but it's about the style. And it was funny because she showed somebody with a frumpy hairstyle. Maybe it was her that she had made it look frumpy, but it, it was like a bob that turned under. And I, I mean, that's kind of, I don't might turn mine under anymore, but I've done that plenty of times just, and I joke all the time that I'm still wearing my high school hairstyle. So if it's an 80s hairstyle, I guess that might be frumpy nowadays. I don't know. But she said that you should have all of the fullness in the crown of your head. And then it needs to be like tighter to your like less right here. And so I'm looking at myself. I'm like opening my iPad and looking at the camera myself. And and I have all this fullness right here, which I can't help. I've always said that as it grows, I look like a triangle head. But she said, next time you're at the salon, just tell them to cut some layers in your salon. Your your hairstylist will say, I thought you'd never ask. So fullness at the crown and less hair at your neck and below your ears. So you're good with that. I mean, you have layers and waves, but it's long. <clears throat> and then she said, the second one is having wrong shoe choices. How do you feel about your shoes? You You have youthful shoes. I feel like I do, although I'm having a harder time finding ones that I like these days. So maybe that means I'm getting older. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I don't wear heels. I mean, I'm trying to think the heeliest shoe I have is like a, um, what do you, a platform sandal. 
And I like those because they look like heels, but they don't feel like heels. So oh, I have some way. of those. You always wear but, cute shoes. Well, I wear sandals, but like you mm-hmm. said, it's kind of harder to find sandals that are cute that also have arch support. <laughs> But she said, make sure you try to pick a few modern shoe choices and not just, I'm thinking like SAS, but SA, you know what SAS is? That's maybe a Texas thing, but they make comfortable shoes for older women. And some of them really do look frumpy, but they have some that look pretty non-frumpy too. And then this third one was overdoing colors and accessories. So how do you feel like you fit there? I don't overdo either one. I'm pretty yeah, bland. I don't think you do. <laughs> I don't think it's <laughs> from one extreme to the other, but she said, like when you get your catalogs, <clears throat> excuse me, frog. But if you get your, she said, if I get my Chico's or my Talbot's catalog and I look through and she said, they all have like all of the earrings and all of the bags and all of the scarves. And she said, but then I remembered that they're just trying to sell me things. So she says to tone it down and that generally if you wear monochromatic things, that's more classy. So she said two colors maximum and she showed examples and like she had one where she had like blue pants and a red sweater and a white vest and it was just too much. But then she wore the same blue pants and a blue shirt and then the white vest and that was good. It's like more monochromatic. So don't overdo your colors and accessories. And then she said, when you wear all classics and nothing modern, that's frumpy. I don't really exactly know what classics are. I just need someone to yeah. dress me, I think. I guess Tell me what to wear. No, no touch of trendy things. Well, I'm kind of out of touch with what's trendy. Yeah. I mean, I don't like what everybody does now where they just tuck the front part of their shirt in and mm-hmm. leave the rest of the shirt hanging out. I'm not ever going to do that because that's where my problem area is. So I'm yeah. just not going to. Men hate it. that. Do they? I know Neil hates that. And then um, I was talking to somebody else at church and she's much younger than me. And she said that her husband feels the same way. He's like, why do you take, why do you take your shirt in that way? (laughs) Well, some people, you know, it looks cute on them, but I, that's Mm -hmm. just not something I'm going to ever be able to do. I'm just not shaped to be able to do that. But um, I mean, I don't even know what else is trendy right now because I don't Mm -hmm. look at modern magazines and stuff like that anyway yeah um, I have mixed feelings about that kind of stuff because um I feel like you should wear what makes you feel good mm -hmm. you know like the bright colors and things um if it makes you feel good to wear something bright you should wear it yeah it comes out in your attitude I think obviously I don't mean anything improper of Mm -hmm. course but if it if it makes you feel good to wear it, if it makes you feel more alive, if it makes you feel happy, you should wear it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I think it makes you feel more confident. If you like yeah. what you have on, it makes it's, you confident and confidence is always attractive, mm-hmm. I think. So then the fourth one is having poor posture and presence. Oh, and yeah, so as, I'm as I sit here, <laughs> as I'm hunched over the laptop. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. I kind of wasted 14 minutes of my life watching that, but I thought I don't really want to be frumpy. I don't mind being my age, but I don't really want to look frumpy either. Yeah. 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 She's got some good stuff on there. I've I've looked at quite a few of her videos. Yeah. Well, you may have to send me some that you're more interested in because I, I had never heard of her before. Yeah. I got a good one. I'll send you. Okay. Um, so last Saturday we went on a date Mm -hmm. on the square and Bowling Green and it wasn't quite time for us to have dinner yet so we were killing some time walking around the cute little shops on the square and this one shop had things from like local artists and so it had um, local pottery and there were even potters in the back with their Mm -hmm. little studio where you could go back there and see them it had jewelry that was locally made some artwork you know things like that It was really cute shop well I ended up finding this vintage tablecloth oh that's that gorgeous cute? love it that is, love that that's your color too that green yeah, it is huge I mean it's folded over like eight mm-hmm. times right now it's cute big enough for my table and I've seen these see somewhere. yeah I've seen it's people these. hiding from the storms it is actually um I've seen these on Etsy you know these mm-hmm. vintage tablecloths that and they're usually pretty pricey but this one was very very reasonable nice 
and um, they had a bunch. I mean, they all lined up on these hangers, and I was like, oh, I love that one. I love that one. I love that one. But I just picked one. But this one. Yeah, Ollie. Hush. I get. I keep my eye out for those, like at Goodwill and stuff, because that. You remember I told you about that date night that we did on our deck for the young yeah. couples. Yeah. So I had individual set tables, like card tables, mm-hmm. and I put a vintage tablecloth on each one, but that what I would be looking for would be the smaller square mm-hmm. ones or maybe a small rectangle, but that'll be good on your table, I guess. Cause yeah. it's so long. Mm-hmm. Have you tried it out yet? I haven't because when I put it up, when I brought it home, I was just going to go ahead and use it right away. Well, the rug under my table is like a vibrant emerald green. Mm-hmm. And this one's more of a muted yeah. colors. And I'm not sure. <laughs> So then when I saw these colors compared to my rug, I thought, well, now I'm feeling like it looks more autumnish, you know, like mm. more fall colors or something. Oh, so it's got that pretty yellow in it. Yeah, true. So anyway, I haven't tried it yet, but. Well, where did y'all go to dinner? Um, This place in town called 404 or 440. I can't remember. It's a steakhouse. Mm-hmm. They had, I ended up ordering the best salad. It was so good. It had all kinds of delicious flavors in it. And then I ordered two appetizers as my main meal. And one was a charcuterie board with all different kinds of breads and meats and toppings and all kinds of mm. fun stuff like that. And then the other one was this barbecue shrimp over jalapeno polenta, jalapeno cheese polenta. Mm. So and what did Neil have? He had a big old fat pork chop. <laughs> it was huge. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, I, I just had to look real quick and see because your birthday, it will not, I was thinking it might be on the day that this comes out, but no, it'll be the day after this comes out. Mm-hmm. So yeah. happy birthday early. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We'll have to talk about you in a group next week. <laughs> I'm sure you'll love that. You like it when we talk about you. I love it. Well, we went and watched Emmy ride last Saturday. It was our first time. We've seen her like practice ride around where they, they board the horse but she was in, it wasn't a competition. They call it a play day. And um, so there's lots of people there from all ages. There was, she was probably, well, it was probably from, they had some four to six year olds. I can't even imagine a four year old riding horse, but they had them. So she was at the older end of the, the young kiddos, but then they had women my age that were riding as well. And they oh. had, um, yeah, really old ladies. Uh, <laughs> But they were they were doing barrels and poles and things like that, and wow. it, was, uh, it was lots of fun. Did you get to watch. There and try it? No, it was not that kind of play day. <laughs> There's a whole lot of things I would need in order to to be able to do that, including some kind of calming thing for my nerves. But she did great. She was fun to watch. She's this little teeny tiny girl, and on this great big old huge horse, and and just commanding that thing. You know, she's still a little tentative, but. Um, but I'm just so proud of her for, for getting on. She's fallen off twice. Um, one, one of them was incidental. It, kind of, it wasn't in a, any kind of a competition, but the, the other one, I refused to watch the video. John has seen it, but I, I was in the room when he was watching it and I could hear the crowd gasp when she fell. Oh, but the dear. horse, yeah, the horse, apparently this, it, the horse's name is Missy and she has run barrels before with someone older and, and more practiced. And I think what happened was if I remember how Jordan Aaron told me that she just something about the crowd, she just stopped. And so Emmy just kind of popped off of her and, but the ground was real soft and she's a little tiny with soft joints and bones. And Mm -hmm. she got back on right away. And anyway, it was fun. I think I may have told y'all about that fall before, but yeah. um, Anyway, she was fine. So yeah, yeah. I bet it, it makes it a lot easier when you start out young to have to learn just the respect and the skill mm-hmm. and have less of the fear, you know, like uh, this is a big creature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She doesn't seem to be afraid. Aaron was cleaning uh, the shoes, the horse's shoes after the competition or whatever it was called play day. And Emmy's just right there next to her lifting the hoof up. And, and I'm thinking she, Emmy's literally walking underneath the horse. And I don't know enough about horses I would never say don't do this or do-. I know you're not mm-hmm. supposed to approach a horse from behind. Mm-hmm. I have heard that before, but she's cleaning the hooves and brushing her down and she can't only re- reach up to about midway up her back, but 
anyway, it was fun to watch her. And I'm glad we got to do that. It was not too far away. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you got anything else? Should we get started on a topic? We should probably get started on topic because I can already hear the thunder yeah. picking up. So <laughs> it might be an exciting episode. So squeeze in as much as we can here. <laughs> yeah, we'll have some sound effects to go with this, yes. this topic. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about something. I, I got a little tickled when I was thinking about this. Um, you know, I sent you the topic a few days ago and, and we're going to talk about um, in a, in a general way, the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationships. But what what I told you and what I want us to do and what we will do is things that we love about our daughters-in-law because we each have three. Well, you and I, of course, are mothers of only boys. And so we got our daughters and uh, you know, it took us a little bit longer to get them, but we have three daughters-in-law. Came to us already grown and mature. So that was nice. I liked that part. But um, I... Our oldest son, Jordan and Aaron, his wife have been married for f- almost 14 years. They got married in 2010. Then our middle son, Jake and his wife, Liz have been married for 10 years. Actually, next week will be 10 years. Wow. And then uh, Mike and Courtney have been married for five years. So how, how long have y'all's kids been married? We got our first daughter-in-law about eight years ago, um, 2016, Gary and okay. Chelsea, and then Janelle and Dale, 2019, Emily and Carl, 2021. Yeah. So we have our, our daughters-in-law and um, what tickled me was that I was talking to Michelle Massey last week about a different idea for a podcast episode that's completely unrelated, but something else that some people might consider. And I'm sure it would be, um, what's the word it would have, it would have, we would have to be approach it very carefully. And she just said, it's fraught. And I thought this one is fraught. It could be fraught. Fraught uh, with what? Fraught with many dangers. That's a fraught great word. With, yeah. 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 So it it could be, but because you and I have such sweet girls, we we have um we have had by and large just really, really good things that have happened. You know, things it's just hard. It, it's been said that when two women love the same man, there's going to be a fireworks sometimes. And so that, you know, when you love your boys and you, nothing changes about that when they get married, you still love your sons, but yet they belong to someone else. And that is just a challenging thing to get used to. And I, I have told Erin this and I feel bad for her, but, but she was the first in, in my life. And so at first it was just hard for me. I don't, I don't think it was I was so thankful for her and I was thankful that he had found someone that he loved and she's Christian and so many good things, but yet it was still hard to know exactly how to navigate that relationship and to, um, how to put distance in a way between me and Jordan because he belonged to her, but yet still be able to express that love that I had, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, I just didn't know how. It's kind of like when your first child is born and you're, you're like, okay, what do I do now? And that's how I felt as you go. (laughs) Yes. And so she was like the one that we, uh, we learned on, of course she learned on us too. But anyway, I found, um, a couple of articles and I was just kind of looking around on the internet to see what I could find. I'm always curious what what's out there. And one of them I sent to you and, and it was by, um, it was in an Indian magazine or an online magazine or newspaper, but it was from Kashmir. And then it was also interesting too, because throughout the article, they referred to God. And I think most people in India are Hindu or Brahmin, Brahmin. I'm not sure, but I just, it was a good article, but it was also presupposed that, that they called them joint relationships or, or joint, what was it called? Joint something, joint households. And so when I looked that up, I looked, what does it mean to have a joint household in India? And it means that multi-generations living in the same home. So not only do you have a mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship, but you're living in the same home. And I know there's been lots of people that have done that over the years in, in the States, but, you know, really biblically that, that was the way it was um, and for a very long time. And that's still the way it's practiced in many areas across the world. But so one of those articles came from India. The other one that I read was in a Jewish publication, but they, it was funny because both of them introduced the topic as saying it's one of the most delicate relationships to navigate. 
they called it a syndrome, the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law syndrome. Oh, wow. And they said that it's a persistent conflict and it's one of the most intricate to navigate. So one, one said delicate and one said intricate. And I thought, well, I mean, it's true. It's just, and why, you know, we were a little nervous to talk about it, not you and I necessarily, but just, I think everyone is a little nervous because nobody wants to have a bad mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship. We all want to get along. We all want to have respect for one another, but it's just, um, it's just a difficult one sometimes. Not even the people involved, although certainly certain personalities are going to complicate things. Mm -hmm. But if we approach it with a biblical mindset and with respect for one another and, you know, look for the good. And that's, that's really where I wanted to go with this today was to look for the good in the relationships that you and I have with our daughters-in-law and not to say, you know, I know both of us say we don't want this to come across as one of those, look how great our family is. It's not that at all. I think most of all, what I, and, and you asked me this, and I think this is always a good question to ask ourselves for these podcasts is what is our goal and our object? And so what my goal is, is for us to maybe open a conversation as to what we as mothers-in-law appreciate about our daughters-in-law. And we can't really speak for them with regard to us, but we can talk about our mothers-in-law and you and I have both have really wonderful mothers-in-law. So um, there were several things. Go ahead. Those words they use intricate and delicate, make it sound like you have to walk on eggshells Mm -hmm. around those relationships, which I think is a little bit unfortunate. I know what they're trying to say, but in some ways it reminds me when Neil was teaching uh, in the 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 school at Bear Valley, you know, training men to mm-hmm. preach. And he had the class preacher in his work. And one of the lessons was about the relationship with elders. Mm-hmm. And he would start out that class by asking all those students, you know, future preachers, what have you heard about the relationship between the preacher and the elder or working under an eldership? And he just filled a whiteboard with everything they said. And they were like 99% negative. Ooh every single thing, you know, about things that could go wrong and things that could happen and what's an unfortunate relationship or a thing that could, an eldership, a way, you know, a personality type or a leadership type, they were all negative. Mm -hmm. And his whole point in doing that, because he knew it was going to turn out that way, is that, you know, how do you feel going into a work with all of these sort of expectations, you know, before you even get started in a work? And I It just kind of makes me think that sometimes this type of relationship is very similar and that a lot of times when you do do hear something about it, it's negative, Mm -hmm. you know, and this could happen and this happened and it's, you know, there's possessiveness and there's misunderstanding and there, you know, all these other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. We always hear the negative side about it. And so how would it, Neil would say, how would it change your work going in if your expectations were positive, yeah. you know, and you thought the best of the eldership that you were about to be working with. Mm-hmm. And I believe that that is very, very true. in this type of new relationship, because it's new for everybody involved, yeah. but if your expectations were positive and you treated them that way, you know, I think it would maybe make it a little bit easier. Oh, absolutely. In fact, one of the things that that I read in those articles and one of the things that I've even said, I've taught this in class, is that a lot of times we come to the relationship already having um, been maybe preconditioned by our families or by things that you see on TV. You know, the, the movie, there's a movie called Monster in Law. Mm-hmm. And I, I laugh about that plant. The only plant that I can keep alive is nicknamed the mother-in-law tongue because it's real sharp. And so we have these preconceived ideas about what that relationship looks like. You know, if your mom had a really bad relationship with her mother-in-law, so that's kind of how you think it's going to be because that's how you experienced it growing up. Or if you had a really good relationship, your mother had a really good relationship. I think that that was the way it was with me because my mom and her mother-in-law, my dad's mom, um, I think it, it always seemed perfectly fine. I know that it wasn't perfect, but there is no relationship, no relationship that's hundred percent perfect. But I just assumed 
that everything was great and that all the mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, it's it's like this instant daughter kind of thing. And um, so those two things can clash if there are two different people that approach it in a different way. You know, one's expecting that it's going to be terrible and the other's expecting that it's going to be great. And there can be all kinds of <laughs> those premeditated resentments that we call expectations. So um, I think that's such a great thing that Neil does talking about elders to preacher training or students. And maybe that's something that we need to talk more to our younger women about is to go into it, having the expectation that it's going to be good and that she's going to be someone that I can rely on and trust. And then those of us who are mothers-in-law be that person, be the kind of mother-in-law that, um, that they consider to be a friend. So that's a good point. Uh, there were several pieces of advice that that they gave in these articles that I thought were so biblical. You know, they didn't necessarily refer to the Bible when they gave the advice, but I I just jotted a few of them down. the The first one that really jumped out at me is that one of them said literally to surrender your will. And I thought that's so Philippians too, you know, when we're to do nothing from selfishness and and with humility of mind, think higher of the other than we think of ourselves. And we might not ever consider that being something, speaking of the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship, but man, how great would it be if we did go into it, um, esteeming one another higher than the other. If the daughter-in-law looked at her mother, like mother-in-law, like, um, I think more of you than I do myself. And if the mother-in-law thought of the daughter-in-law, I'm, I respect you more than I do myself. Wouldn't that be just like the best? It's kind of hard to do because it's hard to do with any relationship, but that was one piece of advice that they gave was surrender your will. And then they said, stifle opinions. And uh, that made me think of Romans 15, bear, bear, weaknesses of other people. Matthew 11, be like Jesus, be gentle and lowly, but um, stifle opinions and mothers-in-law are, that's one of the things. Yeah. Yeah, And that's one of those things that I think just, we have as a mother-in-law, you have this thing that follows you around that you've, you're opinionated Mm -hmm. and maybe. (laughs) So how do you stifle your opinion? I, it's just, um, but you don't, I've always thought this, you don't have to speak everything, you know, I mean, maybe you do know better about something, but maybe that's just better for you and not better for, for your kids and their family. And, you know, that's a hard one because maybe not for, it's not hard for everyone, but I think it's hard for a majority of people to not just want to speak their opinion and then say, well, it's just my opinion. You can take it or leave it, but then we don't like it when people don't take it. I think that's the best advice that Neil and I were given when we were entering into this phase. And somebody said, here's the rule. And you don't ever break this rule. (laughs) (laughs) Do they have their finger pointed out like that? Yes. Just like that. Always encourage. And it was talking about, you know, with your, it was actually your son and his wife, you know, with both Mm -hmm. of them, always encourage and never offer advice unless they ask for it. Yeah. And the caveat was, unless you see something like spiritually dangerous going on, Mm -hmm. you know, and even that, I think you could offer it carefully. Yeah, definitely. But, um, and I feel like that's been the best advice we've Mm -hmm. ever been given. And I feel like we, we try really hard. Although sometimes I catch myself saying something Mm -hmm. and not realizing until after it's come out of my mouth. Yeah. But that was a very opinionated thing to say. And it could mm-hmm. be taken like I'm trying to make a point or, you know, um, yeah. so. <laughs> do you go back and say something like that after you've said it? Do you say, do you go back and say, I'm, that's my opinion or how do you handle that? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I usually don't think about it. <laughs> you just it overthink it later. I just, yeah. When I'm in bed at night going, mm-hmm. oh, that probably came across like, <laughs> yeah. like dropping hints or something or. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Grady and Janice were so great about that. It was, you, you would never hear them offer any advice. And sometimes we'd be like, you know, we might say something and and I, I could sense that they might want to say something, but Mm -hmm. they never would. They would never, even if we asked them, 
he Grady, you know, he was just funny. He he would be he'd shuffle around and he'd hang his head and you know, he didn't want to say anything because he didn't want to to get in the middle of our marriage. And they were just so great about that. And and um I mean Alyssa and Jacob sometimes will say, will ask us, what what have what are you seeing us do parent wise that you think we should do differently? And yeah. Wow. That's that's <laughs> That's very humble of them. <laughs> it is. It is very humble of them. And, you know, it's, I, I don't feel like I can't say anything. You know, if they ask, I feel like I, I could. I don't have a lot of critique. I think there's always something people can do differently. And, but I think how great of them to just, you know, because they, they'll say, I know that you're not going to say it unless we ask. So we're just asking, is there something that you think that we could do differently with, with, with their parenting? So, mm-hmm. yeah. So anyway, that other piece, that that's a piece of advice is to stifle your opinions. Um, the next one was to remove expectations, which we've talked about many times on this podcast before about how expectations are premeditated resentment. So, you know, I know that I went into this relationship, especially with Erin, bless her heart, because she was my first daughter-in-law that I had expectations and not, I don't think any of them were, um, that she was going to be a certain way necessarily, but I had expectations of, of us. Um, I don't even know. I, don't, I can't even think back. It's been 14 years, but I know that I, like I expected that our relationship was going to be just like mine and my mother-in-law. And, and Janice was a completely different person than me. She's, you know, I'm introverted, but she was super introverted and she was very, very content to, um, stay way, way back in the background. And, and I'm not quite like that. You know, I'm a little different. So, you know, anytime you go into something with an expectation, if you're not prepared for that to, to be a little bit different and make the the adjustments and corrections, then it's going to be a little bit hard, Mm -hmm. especially if you don't have, if you don't feel like you can say anything, you know, if you don't, if, if Aaron couldn't say, hang on a second, can we talk about this? Or, you know, it was just, that was a little bit hard. I think maybe she also had some expectations and I did. And so we just had to work through some of those and nothing bad. It was just, just took us some time. And it was, um, and it, I mean, she's one of my best friends now, so I'm very thankful for that, but remove expectations. Anything you want to add to that one? Mm -mm. The next, the one that I thought tied into that was to respect their decisions. And I was just telling um, someone in my family yesterday that most, one of the most life-changing things for me was to realize that not everyone thinks like I do. (laughs) I think, well, I don't know why they don't (laughs) because I think right about everything, not, but when you, when you think a certain way, if you don't tell yourself, not everyone has that same opinion, not everyone thinks that way. Um, then it's hard to respect other people's, uh, people's other decisions. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe your, your son and his family are busier than you, than you want to be. And this is something, I mean, I think about all the things that all of my kids are involved in and, uh, driving, doing lots of driving. And I think, oh, I don't, I wouldn't want to do that. And I remember my mom doing this to me. But at the time, it was just what we did. You know, it's just, it was a way of life. And so when my mom would say, you just, you really shouldn't do that. Of course, I think moms are a little bit more free to offer advice than mothers-in-law are, or I think that, I don't know. Um, So if, if they've made the decision to do the driving wherever they need to go to get the kids to wherever they need to be or work decisions, if you're gonna drive far to get to work, that's their decision, respect their decision and, and respect the fact that they're old enough to have their own home and to have their own money and to have their own ability to make those decisions. And that's freeing to me. Like, okay, maybe I don't want to do it that way, but good for them. That's what they've decided to do. And you and I have to kind of catch ourselves and remind ourselves if we're in the middle of we're in on a conversation with them and, you know, something's coming up and they're trying to figure out how to adjust the schedule or 
work something out or whatever. It's, it's just, it almost feels so automatic to say, well, why don't you just blah, 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 you know, and mm-hmm. we kind of have to remind each other, they'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know, they're adults. They want to figure it out for themselves. They don't need us to figure it out. For yeah. them and think for them, mm-hmm. they'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Do y'all have secret signals? Like, do you pinch Neil under the table? If I don't know how off? secret they are. <laughs> I feel like anytime I try to signal, he's like, what? Yeah. John will look at me. What'd you pinch me for? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, ah, well, trying that to didn't go so there. well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we don't have any problem with that. <laughs> well, let me just run through the rest of these and then we can get a little more specific. And the, the next one was to be fair to treat each other with preference. And so the, the, these things that I was reading, they were saying, if you have a daughter and a daughter-in-law, you treat them just the same. If you like, if you buy a gift for your son, buy a gift for your daughter-in-law, which is to me, it's like, duh, why wouldn't Mm -hmm. you do that? It's Mm -hmm. they're every bit as much family now as, as, um, as your biological child. But they were saying it goes the other way too, that daughters-in-law treat your mother-in-law like you would your mother. And um, so that when I look back on when I was younger, I, I sort of, you know, back then pictures were literally you go to the drugstore and have them printed out and give them a three and a half by five photograph of your children. And now it's a little different. You get texted photos mm-hmm. and stuff, but I know that I always made my mom copies of pictures, but I don't know that I automatically at first anyway, did that for Janice because I just didn't think about it, Mm -hmm. which now just makes me feel horrible because she, it was every bit as much my children's grandmother as my mom was, but I just had a different relationship with my mom. And, you know, I look back on that with a lot of regret and, and I did, I told Janice, you know, when I was old enough to realize that I had done those kind of things and she laughed it off and said, I never thought anything about it, but she had to have, it had to have hurt her sometimes that I didn't treat her um, with the same kind of preference that I did my mom. I guess I assumed that John would do those things, but guys don't do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like the mother's day gifts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I would, I would do that, but I wanted John to have a a hand in it too, because that was his mom. I wanted him to pick something out for her. I always made sure that she had something too, but um, anyway, uh, be fair, treat each other with the same preference. You would your own daughter or your own child or your own mother. Mm -hmm. Um, This one was probably the, the hardest one that I had to deal with is to recognize that there's been a change in your relationship. Speaking about with your son. And so, um, you know, as mothers of sons, this, this is just a difficult thing because the way they put it in the, in the, what I was reading is it remains significant, but it is changed. And, um, I think probably I, I didn't realize that was going to happen, especially with the first one, you know, with Jordan, like, I think I knew it logically that something's going to change, but my heart didn't really follow along with that. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) you got more company coming in downstairs, hopefully downstairs anyway. Right. Oh yeah. Anyway, just recognize that there is a change in relationship. And this would be, I think for both mother-in-law and daughter-in-law for mother-in-law to realize, you know, and I, again, I can't speak for what it's like when you have a, daughter and a son-in-law, but for a a son and a daughter-in-law to go from, you know, you've raised this little boy and you've, he was your heart, you know, your heart walking around outside your body and, and you lived and breathed for that child and, and you did everything to, to help him to grow physically and emotionally and spiritually and and all of the things. And then all of a sudden he's not yours anymore. And I think that was just one that was the hardest for me of anything. Not that I wasn't willing to recognize that change, but that it was, it was just hard on my heart and I didn't know how to handle it. And, um, I didn't know how much distance to put between my, myself and my son 
in order for them to have their own family, you know, yet with me still having a part in his life. So that was, that was the one that was the most emotionally difficult and still, you know, still sometimes is there's so much that far outweighs that. Now the, the relationship that they have is dear and precious to me to see that their own family, but yet, you know, just remembering that this is my son and, and I, I loved him beyond any way of ex- explaining and, and how do you make that shift? I don't know. I think you've probably had some of that too. And, but that was my hardest thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think it's one of those things where you, you only imagine what it might be like. And then there's that. And then the actual experience and maybe some of the things that you navigate through all the new relationships were nothing that you were expecting. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we probably expected some things to be different or maybe challenging or whatever. And then they ended up being a non-issue. And then maybe things Mm -hmm. that you weren't expecting to be awkward or I don't really know what I'm doing here, you know, can kind of trip you up a little bit just because Mm -hmm. you weren't expecting it. And if you've never experienced it, you're just learning as you go. And, you know, I'm just thankful that when the relationships are, have that same foundation of Jesus Christ, then we're, we're gracious with each other, Mm -hmm. (laughs) patient, you know, I think about some things I've done already, you know, that without even thinking, um, that, you know, looking back, I was like, Oh, I can't believe I did that or said that or whatever. And could have been a lot more difficult than it ended up being, but because, we're all trying to be loving and patient and gracious with each other. Mm -hmm. It makes it a lot smoother, you know? Yeah. 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 It's hard stuff. Uh, The next one is they, they called it Q-tip quit taking it personally. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Q-tip quit taking it personally. And uh, yeah, I I think that's across the board and not just uh, in this kind of relationship, but any relationship stop taking things personally. And this really struck me. They said, let go of the burden of judgmental thought patterns. Mm -hmm. And if you're always waiting for someone to hurt your feelings, you're going to, it's like, you've always said uh, you're going to find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for your daughter-in-law to say something that offends you, then you're going to find it. You know, what does she mean by that? Or why didn't she do this? Or, you know, it's just stop taking things personally. I mean, that's self-explanatory and it's, something you have to train yourself to do or not do. Um, but always ask yourself, maybe she meant that a different way. Um, uh, maybe she's having a bad day. Maybe she meant that for someone else. You know, there's all kinds of ways that we can think differently and stop taking things personally. Then they said <clears throat> to praise and thank, to look for the good. Of course, that made me think of first Corinthians 13, how love is not provoked, mm-hmm. not easily provoked. And when I looked that word up, it means irritated it's not love is not easily irritated and um so that goes both ways you know mothers and daughters-in-law don't be ir- easily irritated with one another and also not taking into account a wrong that's suffered mm-hmm. you know it's like we just count up all these things that the other one's doing and oh that it just that's exhausting to me to think about people who um they it's like they're keeping a list of these wrongs that that they perceive have happened to them and just that's that victim mentality and mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law can both do that and play that game. And it's just not, not one for a Christian to play. And then the other piece of advice they gave was to offer to help. Um, Mine are good to offer to help. And, And I think that can be a tricky one too. Like if we make it hard for them to help, like if we have a certain particular way that we like to do things and they don't do it that way. If we make it, if we make them afraid to be in our kitchen or afraid to be in our home. So uh, that's, that's tricky. So anyway, those were some of those pieces of advice that came from a secular source, but I think that they're all biblical and helpful. So I thought, unless you have anything to add to that, we would just talk about our daughters-in-law and some things that we love about them. Do you have something you want to say? Well, first I want to say that it's ironic that on this day, 10 years ago, I taught a lesson at focal point to the women. And my assignment was the kind of women I want my sons to marry. Huh. Before and any of course, them were married. Yeah, none, of, none of them were <laughs> married. So I'm just making this stuff up, you know, mm-hmm. 
but it was fun to go back. I pulled that out. It was fun to go back and just read, you know, what, what I was kind of anticipating where I thought I might go with that. And, um, maybe, maybe I can share some of that stuff yeah. later in the group or something. Be but fun. Yeah. Um, I was thinking when we were talking about this topic that, do you remember the very first time your mother-in-law came to visit, you know, after you were married to her son and she came to visit in your home. So this is your space and mm -hmm. your kitchen and your mm -hmm. living room and your yeah. inviting atmosphere, all these things. And I was thinking back to that pressure that I put on myself because I'm assuming some things. I'm mm -hmm. assuming that the house needs to be perfectly clean. The meal needs to be wonderfully prepared. And of course, I need to be extra special in my relationship with her son. You know, like yeah. I just felt like those are the types of things that she'd be looking at as she's visiting my home for the first mm -hmm. time. How am I measuring up yeah. as I'm taking care of her son's environment? And, um, and it really wasn't until I became a mother-in-law myself that I realized how ridiculous that was yeah. because I don't care about any of that stuff, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm never wondering about the condition of their home or the kind of food or that their relationship is absolutely perfect. All that, you know, I've never, yeah. that stuff never even crosses my mind. And all I'm hoping for is that they know how much I love them. And I'm thankful that we're all get to share this family experience together mm -hmm. and you know, that I feel honored to be in their lives and I want them to be happy. You know, those yeah. are the only things going through my mind. <laughs> you want to put them at ease and you're worried. Yeah. You were worried yeah. about putting her at ease. Yeah. Yeah. So I look back to my young self as, you know, being a daughter-in-law for the first time and how nervous I was. And it wasn't my mother-in-law's fault. She never acted in a way to made me feel like I had to measure up or, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Yeah, she, she was the sweetest person on the, she is the sweetest person. <laughs> she still is. Um, but I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? As a newly, yeah. as a newlywed, yeah. mm -hmm. she never put pressure on me or these expectations. It was all me yeah. and the assumptions that I was having. So I really think it goes both ways, mm -hmm. you know, that we can have these kind of make these assumptions or have these expectations and put this extra pressure on ourselves that maybe is not even there to begin with. Yeah. Extra um, pressure that right there yeah. is that could just encapsulate every mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship probably is that we put extra pressure on ourselves, I think. Yeah. And maybe on, yeah. on the other two as well. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Ooh. So for all of that, my first thing that I thought of that I feel like is such a huge blessing with a mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship is the fact that um, they are all easy to love and be around. And I think yeah. it's because of what I kind of assumed I, for whatever reason, I don't know why I just assumed that my boys were going to find these girls that would be all that. And I would feel awkward around them. <laughs> 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 and, you know, like, but I would do my best to make sure we had a smooth relationship for my son's sake, you know, because yeah. I would do my part and I'd do my best in a relationship so that they could have an easier marriage and, you know, whatever it took, I would bend over backwards for them. none of that. None mm -hmm. of that has happened, you know, and <laughs> I just, from the very beginning with, with all three of them, they just were normal, likable Christian women that mm -hmm. I felt completely at ease with and completely comfortable with and, and wanted to do my part to make the relationship good for their sake, mm -hmm. not for, not your for sons, my son's for them. sake, yeah. yeah, because of who they are. And mm -hmm. so maybe just, because they were nameless, faceless before and you're all you yeah. knew was your sons, but now you know, they're individuals, they're actual souls and people that you have a relationship with. Yeah. I'm sure that's what it is, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason I thought it was it was going to be a lot different than it went down so that's my number one thing it's just yeah. that they have made it so easy for me to be comfortable like it feels yeah. completely normal for them yeah to be in the same space with me if that makes yeah. sense and I just find that, that hugely relieving <laughs> yeah. so you don't make it weird with them huh I probably do but 
I don't they, feel it. They laugh. Yeah, they laugh yeah. rather than hold anything against you. <laughs> yeah, you have sweet girls. Well, my first one is kind of related to what I was talking to a minute ago about how I, I feel bad about how I did not communicate all that much with my mother-in-law. And again, I understand that it's different now. You know, we have texts and we have um, email and just there's so many different ways to communicate. Whereas before it was either a person in-person visit or a telephone call. Mm -hmm. Um, But my girls all, one of the things that I just love so much and appreciate so much is that they all communicate with me, me and them, you know, it's not through my son, but they communicate with me. They all send me pictures, which I, I, that's my favorite thing in the world is to look down at my phone and I have a text from one of my girls because more often than not, it's going to have a picture of one of my grandkids or of them, because I love getting pictures to see the things that they're doing, but they'll, you know, they'll let me know if there's news going on in the house, in their household or, and and it's not just those little facts or pictures, but, but they communicate their feelings to me. And, and I, I treasure that Mm -hmm. because it's, it's a relationship. It's like you're talking about, they make, they make it easy to love them, but it's because I think I now realize that it's a relationship that I have a separate, separate and apart from my relationship with my son. I have these three girls, three women who are friends. And I mean, what a blessing. Mm -hmm. And I think that each of them in their own way has made me feel special or like you know, as we say, I feel seen or I feel heard. I feel like they know me. And, you know, sometimes they'll text me a picture of something and they'll say, this made me think of you. You might like this. Um, or I, this, you might like to try this recipe or this shirt looks like you or gifts that they give me. They, they just, they make me, they communicate with me. They make me feel like they know me and like we were talking about last week with the topic about um, when, when things are right with God, um, when, when God shows his love to us, we love him more. And when they show that love to me, it just makes me love them more. And when they communicate with me, it makes me feel loved. So I'm just very appreciative of that. And that's one of the things that I love the most about them. Yeah. Neil has commented before when the kids are all here, usually the girls end up in the kitchen you know, (laughs) and, um, Neil will say something afterwards, like they know your love language, you know, and, and it's true. I feel like that's what you're saying is they know how to touch your heart and, um, what's important to you. And it's almost like there should be a special volume of the love, the love languages (laughs) just for (laughs) that mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship. Yeah. -hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's true. I didn't, hadn't thought about that because mine is um, quality time. So yeah, Mm -hmm. they all know that that I love that quality time and I love having it with the boys too. Um, and, and, you know, another thing, just thinking about how I was with my mother-in-law, I, it's okay to me if they're closer to their moms, because it's just, mm-hmm. it's just a natural thing. They have mothers and they've known that their mother since before they were born. So I, that, that doesn't bother me at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do feel loved and appreciated when they make me feel special and communicate with me. So anyway, what else do you have? Uh, My next one is um, they don't complain to me about their husbands. (laughs) (laughs) Uh Uh, And they could, I'm sure. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Your boys are all perfect. Well, yes, they are. But, you know, and I don't, I don't think that it's, it's not that they don't ever, you know, like joke around and, you know, say teasing things about them or stuff like that, but they just mm-hmm. don't ever get whiny or gripey or complain, you know, and not that they couldn't, I hope. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm just scary. I don't know, but they just don't. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's intentional or if, if it's just the nature of their personalities, you know, but they just don't. And I appreciate that. And, um, and I've also noticed that they, say not only do they not complain about them but they say positive things about them Mm -hmm. and you know and it's almost like they know that that's gonna make me feel good 
and um, or they'll share something. We have, you know, like a family text, group family text. And if something good was said about one of the boys, you know, their wife is really quick to say, hey, yeah. just got this from so and so. And, you know, or they'll take, you know, listen to this lesson. I was so proud of my husband for this Bible class. You know, like they are. Mm -hmm. They say praising him to yes, you. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And I think that's huge. Yeah. And remarkable. And mm -hmm. um I just love that they do that. I think it shows their generosity and you know, their loving hearts. And I mean, we know what it's like to be newlyweds and mm -hmm. married to someone and learning all the quirks and all that kind of stuff. And um, I don't know. I just think that's a huge gift. I really yeah, appreciate that. It is. Well, that makes me think of one that I've written down similar to that. Just the fact that they love my son, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and I have walked behind all of them at some point or another in their marriage and they're holding hands. And that just makes my heart just like want to burst mm -hmm. because they like each other and they love each other. And what more could you want mm -hmm. for your son than to know that, that the woman he loves, loves him back. And that's just something I I had never even thought about that being important because, you know, to me, it's like, well, of course they do. They married them. But, um, but I don't know that I even really thought about how I would want and need to see evidence of that love between my son and his wife. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just, it makes my heart happy because they're, they're making their own memories and they're making their own families and they're making their own traditions. And I love that they, they're, mm -hmm. They're all big on making traditions with their wives and kids. And, um, you know, when I think about what if my parents or John's parents had not allowed us, allowed John and me the freedom and the, you know, the, I don't know how to say it. What if they had not allowed us to do that on our own? Like you have to follow our traditions. If they had been upset because we didn't do things exactly like they did. You know, I've just always been so grateful that my my in-laws allowed us to have our own family and gave us space and distance. Even though we lived close, they never made us feel like um, you have to do everything with us. You have to, I guess it's hard to explain, but I just, I would never begrudge them the happiness of making their own family traditions and having their own Christmas morning together, you know, let them do their son, their Christmas morning tradition or their, mm -hmm. um, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that they have their own families. I love that they have their own friends. They do their own thing. And, um, so that, that just, the fact that my daughters-in-law love my son, that, that might be my top one. I should have said mm -hmm. that first, but that's probably my favorite one. Well, I won't mention any names on which son and daughter-in-law this was, but, <laughs> we had we had one of the a couple staying with us for a little while and when they first did I remember one time Neil and I were in the living room and we heard that they were both in the shower <laughs> did you just give a little that. TMI I did and and um so we heard our daughter-in-law just bust out laughing I mean she was cracking up about something. And at first, Neil and I are looking at each other like, hello, you know, trying to cover our ears or whatever. <laughs> but then we were just grinning like ninnies because yeah. we're like, well, they're still making each other laugh, mm -hmm. you know, and that's my all time favorite thing is, yeah. you know, we know they're going to have fights and disappointments and straight, you know, all the things that every couple goes through. But as long as they're still making each other laugh, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that's, it just, they want to be together. Mm -hmm. Yes. It just warms my heart when I yeah. hear that. And yeah. I'll never forget that moment though. Cause we were like, well, <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you. Uh -huh. Well, it's funny. Cause you know, I keep hearing your doorbell chime. And so I know that you have at least a couple of your kids downstairs. So I'm just picturing the, them like sitting at, right behind you at your basement door, listening to what you're talking about right now. I'm thinking, <laughs> I know I am thinking, can they hear me? Because I, I can't remember if we said this in the beginning or not, but because we're in a tornado watch, mm -hmm. some gathering of them in your basement are yeah. Hanging out in the basement. Cause yeah. it's a safer environment than where they're at. But yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and another one that I thought of that I love about my girls, my, I don't want to call them my women. That sounds funny. So they'll call them my girls is that the fact that they, all of these things that we've talked about, they've become friends to me, you know, it, all of these things led to friendship. And I think that they see me more and they treat me more as a, a friend or as a friend more so than just their husband's mother. I feel like an individual to them and not just a mother-in-law. Erin mm-hmm. you know, and I worked together for, I don't know, four or five years. She, she and her mom had a, an embroidery shop that I, I would drive twice a week down to St. Marcus and work with them. And that was so much fun. It was fun work as it was, you know, crafty, creative and stuff, but because we'd sit around and talk when we were working on those things in the back and you get to know someone when you work with them like that. And so that, you know, bonded us in a, in a fun way. And, and I think just led to us having a tighter relationship and I just enjoy being with them. They're just, they're, they're fun to be with. And of course I love their husbands and I love their kids too. But um, one of the things too, in uh, along those lines is that the longer that they're in the family, the longer they're married to, to my son, they know our extended family. And this is something that I think I've mentioned before that I treasure about being married to John for almost 38 years now is that we know everything about each other's past and we know each other's families. And if I say something about my aunt Jean, he knows who I'm talking about. If he tells me something about a high school friend, I know he's talking about. And now our daughters-in-law are part of that. And they they know things that have gone on in our families, whether John's family or my family. And we're, we're, I'm able to confide in them about things that mm-hmm. are troubling me. And so it's not, it's not just um, a family relationship, it's a friendship. And so mm-hmm. I, I really do treasure that. And I, I hope that other mothers-in-law out there have that same kind of relationship. Yeah. My next one is very similar. Um, I, I said, even though they, they each have their own wonderful Christian mothers and I'm thankful for that. They all have Christian moms. They're all close to their moms. Um, even though they each have their own wonderful Christian mothers, they're generous with their love for me too. And, and I'm just, I'm grateful for that. They, you know, they spend time with me. They let me into their lives. Um, Mm -hmm. I feel like they, they make it feel natural, you know, uh, mm-hmm. not like an obligation. <laughs> yeah. It may, it may be, you know, because they are, they do have such a good relationship with their own mom, mm-hmm. but I feel like they just make it feel natural. And I'm grateful for that, you know, yeah. that they're letting me be a part of their lives and mm-hmm. sharing their love with me too. So, yeah. Well, my last <laughs> one, and I, I could have thought of lots and you and I talked about beforehand, we don't, we didn't want this to be any kind of thing that you know, a humble brag of any kind, like about our families, but we just want, I think we just want this to be an encouragement for mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law and potential mothers-in-law, daughters-in-law that you can have a good, a wonderful relationship with each other, even if there are struggles along the way, because everyone's going to have them. But um, I can't even remember why I went down that path, but my last one is (laughs) (laughs) I trust these I trust them and I, I don't ever feel like they're speaking badly of me to other people. Not that, you know, they, they may have confided in a friend if there was something that they were struggling with about me and that's fine. Um, but we, we have, everyone has friends that they work through things with, but I don't ever feel like they're running me down. I don't ever worry that, you know, when I walk into a room of people that they know that they're looking at me like, oh, there she is. You don't ever want a group of people to say, oh, there she is. I just never have felt like I've had any reason to think that they wanted to or felt like they needed to slam me or, or you know, maybe that seems kind of drastic for me to say that. But I, I've i known women who mm-hmm. you just you've heard them say nothing but bad things about their mothers in law. And I've just never felt like they've done that. So I'm very grateful for that. My last one, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to word it because I really struggled with how to word it. Mm-hmm. Like I know what I'm thinking, but I'm having a hard time explaining it. So let me just try. But I appreciate the fact that they became contributors in our family, like in the whole family dynamic instead of just takers. And what I mean by that is um, 
I feel like they each just jumped right in and found their place and they you know, like, and now the family wouldn't seem right without them. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about some of the things that I've witnessed each of them do for the other daughters-in-law or, you know, not just their, their husband, my son, but the, the other brothers, you know, if they see one of them has had, you know, something bad happen or they're struggling with something, it's like, they're all kind of rallying around and this is what we're going to do to jump in and pitch in and help out and lift up. And, you know, it was like, they just all kind of, it wasn't like they just stood back and said, yeah, that's your family. Mm -hmm. You know, I love them all, but that's your family. Yeah. And I felt like instead they just, they just jumped right in. That's our family. Joined arms and Mm -hmm. became, you know, active members, if you will. Yeah. And, you know, so essential and so loving. And here I am. I want to be a part of this and I want to do my part. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really grateful for that too. Yeah. I love the way you worded that. I think that's perfect. And and, um, just made me think that all three of mine are very different. Uh, And if anyone who knows my daughters-in-law, you know, I have one that's quiet like me and one that's not. And she would freely admit that she's not, (laughs) she's an extrovert. And then probably one that's sort of in between. And, um, but just like my sons are all very, very different. Um, they have different personalities, but everyone finds their niche and everyone loves each other. Even if um, they would do things differently or they would see things maybe in a little bit different way, they love each other. And as a parent, there's, you know, you want your, your children to love one another, even when they don't, um, you know, the boys used to roll around on the floor and punch one another and get mad at each other and stuff. But but I knew that they loved one another. And and I think of God and how God sees us sometimes when we bicker and fight and how that hurts me. If that, when that went on, when they were younger, you know, I just wanted them to love one another and they do now they they're grown men who love one another. And um, even in their personality differences, I'm grateful for that. And the girls, the women, they all, um, I know that they love one another. So it's just, it's a blessing to have daughters-in-law who are Christians who uh, love God on their own. They have their own relationship with the Lord. So I'm just um, beyond thankful for that, beyond thankful for the fact that that God saw fit to allow us to have these relationships with these precious women. So anyway. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> we just, like you said, we just hope this will be an encouragement to um I'm thinking about the different perspectives we're sharing from our perspective Mm -hmm. of being now the (laughs) mother-in-law, yeah, the monster-in-law. No. Um, So hopefully sharing what we think are the blessings in the relationship and what has meant so much to us, you know, um, maybe we never even saw it coming, but it just went straight to our heart and touched us. Hopefully that'll be encouragement to, especially our younger Women listening in, you know, we pray that if you're a daughter-in-law and you have a mother-in-law, that you have a good relationship. And if not, you know, pray that um, hopefully things can be done that can grow that relationship and see the blessings of that growth and that relationship. And, um, you know, through God, he's the great relationship mender Mm -hmm. and builder. So uh, it can be just a wonderful, positive thing. Yeah. Not perfect by any means. No relationship is. Yeah. Even with your own real mom. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. can definitely be wonderful and a and a huge blessing, a completer of the life, the family. Yeah, absolutely. That's perfectly said. We just wanted to uh, help help everyone to see that something that the world kind of jokes about and speaks about in a disparaging way it doesn't have to be that way, even when there are struggles to overcome. And we've had some, and I know you've had some, that's just personality differences. It's just the way it is. But when we respond in the right way and act biblically and have a godly attitude and um, think about others more so than ourselves, Mm -hmm. then things are going to work out just fine. So anyway, just a little bit of encouragement, hopefully. Do you have something good for me? No. (laughs) Do you have something good for everyone else? (laughs) I've been racking my 
No, I've been racking my brain. I even pulled out, I almost shared something dippy just to have something. And I was like, I just don't have anything. I'm sorry. Hopefully I'll make up for it next time. What you got? What's a dippy? What does dippy mean? Like not very exciting. I've never heard that expression. I don't know that it's an expression. Well, that's your something good this week is the word dippy, which I kind of think <laughs> is fun to say. That's dippy. I'm going to have to remember that one. Okay. Mine is You're a book. You're welcome. Oh, thank you. Mine is a book and it is something that um, a friend of ours, she's a neighbor, Kay Kazire is her name, lives up the street and she sent it down with John. He went to take her something and, and she sent it home for me to read to our granddaughter. It's a little bit too, it was too old for Turner, but I read it and it's an author that I've mentioned before, actually, it's called Peter's First Easter I don't really love the title because it's so much more than that. It's not, you know, because Easter is just kind of, it's not a word that's in the Bible. I understand what it means. And, mm -hmm. but it's by Walter Wangerin and he's the one that wrote the book of God. And I've, I believe that that has been on one of my book lists before. Um, he also wrote just a, two different, his, you know, it's like historical fiction, one called Jesus and one called Paul. Mm -hmm. And it's fictionalized account of Jesus and, and Paul, two separate books. Yeah, but this is, one. yeah. Um, and I'm rereading Paul right now, right before we go on this next trip, just because I'm thinking following oh, along some of those yeah. places. Good idea. But you know, it's not, they don't have it electronic. It's nothing. I can't get it on Kindle or on Apple books. It's only in paperback, which with my eyes is not great. But anyway, um, this is the story. It's from Peter's eyes. The whole story of beginning at the Last Supper mm -hmm. through the resurrection, mm -hmm. and it's written for kids. I would say probably it's um, it's about let's see thirty pages, and it's not you know little tiny print; it's bigger print. But mm -hmm. the illustrations are fantastic, and it's just the sweetest thing. It's you know it talks about how he feels when he betrays the Lord, and how he feels when he um, they go to the tomb and it's empty. But anyway, it's Peter's First Easter, written by Walter Wangren, illustrated by Timothy Ladwig. And I loved, you can, if you're watching, you can see oh, the yeah. kind of illustrations. And I just, it was, yeah, that's great. I had tears leaking out of my eyes when I finished it. It was just a really sweet, sweet book. So that's my something good. Peter's First Easter. Well, it was good enough for both of us. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that wasn't dippy at all. Okay. Well, it's been a good discussion and I hope that you don't swirl away into the clouds. I hope nothing yes. happens and um, keep us updated. Oh. Okay. We might see you on the news. Hope not. Oh dear. <laughs> All right. Well, I love you and thanks for the discussion and until next time.